This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Our next speaker is Chris Caldwell from Ecos Consulting, who's going to tell us what he would tell the president about appliances. Uh, does the White House need new refrigerators? <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Uh, it would be tempting in a talk like this, I think, to focus mostly on what we've already achieved and to congratulate the assembled uh, prestigious folks on, on our many successes in appliances. But I'd like to challenge us instead to think about what we can and must achieve in the years ahead. And uh, as the old saying goes, it can be hard to see that far into the future, but I think we can do it because we're standing on the shoulders of giants, including art. So uh, let me begin with this slide. Uh, this was an AHAM slide, the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, and it dates back a ways. You can see it only goes to 1997. But you can see here a track record of remarkable success in reducing the average annual energy use of a variety of common appliances like clothes washers, dishwashers, room air conditioners, and refrigerators. And indeed, if we extended the chart forward, you would see that the savings continued to accrue in the following years from mandatory efficiency standards, from labeling, from utility incentives, and so forth. But I think we also need to challenge ourselves to measure success in the most effective way. This is a chart that was shared uh, with attendees at an Energy Star partner meeting in 2006. And you can see that it, it, it celebrates a dramatic uptick in the uh, sales percentage of Energy Star labeled appliances. But uh, on the one hand, we're selling more and more labeled products. But on the other hand, if 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the products bear the Energy Star label, doesn't that also tell us that maybe the label needs to update more frequently and that it needs to be more challenging to earn the label? so that it really does resemble, uh, so it really does represent the state of the art in the market, the state of the art. And so uh, let's begin, uh, I guess, as we think about where to go from here by just getting clear on what we mean by appliances. So obviously appliances are not just white goods. They're, they're not just the clothes washers and dishwashers that we all think of. If you go to the dictionary, it'll say things like an appliance is a device or a control that is very useful for a particular job. Here's another definition, which is equally generic. Uh, here's one, a device or instrument designed to perform a specific function, especially an electrical device, such as a toaster for household use. I would submit that this broader definition is more true to what appliances actually do in 2010 and to what we need to achieve with them. So an appliance could be a cordless drill. It could be a set-top box. It could be a computer or any of these other devices like a lawnmower, uh, game consoles, television set, or my favorite one, a refrigerator with a television set built in. <laughs> and uh, I think the British had it right a few years ago uh, when they published this report, and they said, all of these things you see in front of this person in the room, those are our appliances today. How efficient are they? How much energy do they use? What can we do about it? So, uh, so I would submit the following definition. Uh, appliances are really just what we would call plug loads. They're movable devices that plug in and they consume energy to perform useful tasks in the home. So I'm not going to run through all this, but you can see you've got uh, in the home you have some things about the structure itself that cause the house to use energy, some things that are hardwired to the structure and, and are themselves energy users, and appliances are all the stuff that the home occupant separately purchases and brings with them into the home and then plugs in. I'm indebted uh, for this chart to Gil Masters of Stanford, but if you look at this, it's quite astonishing how um, some devices like automobiles and the telephone and, and electricity itself took literally decades before 60, 70, 80 percent of Americans had them in their homes. As you move more and more to the left, you see that the curves are getting vertical. And even this chart uh, dates back to 1996. So if we were up to update it today, you'd see that things like 
the internet, the personal computer, and the cell phone have rocketed to massive adoption in very short periods of time. What that means is that uh, we have a lot of a challenge in front of us to keep up with the rapid adoption of these new technologies. Here's a, here's a chart summarizing DOE data that just simply shows we are, on the one hand, a victim of our own success. I mean, lighting, HVAC, water heating, and the traditional large appliances, those loads are not expected to grow that much between now and 2030. That's a good thing. We can celebrate that. But everything that's not being regulated is going to be the growth. And so we've highlighted here the plug loads, the, the things like consumer electronics and office equipment that are literally the majority of the growth we face and the majority of the opportunity to achieve savings. I, uh, I did some work recently on, on looking back at refrigerators. It's our favorite success story. I'm sure all of you expected me to show the famous refrigerator chart that Art and David Goldstein and so many of the rest of, of our uh, colleagues in the field have used. And it is a huge success. About, we've had about a 75% reduction in the amount of energy it took to cool one cubic foot of space in a refrigerator. And that's true in the US or in the EU. But think about this. We've got 22% of US houses that now already contain a second older fridge. And that's the highest percentage ever, even after years of running second fridge programs to get those out of garages. Uh, by some estimates, there are about 156 million total fridges in use in the US now. And even though the new ones are very, very efficient, the average one is using about 968 kilowatt hours a year because they're old. They've been around for a while, and they're going to stay around for a while. On a global basis, it's really, really hard to get numbers. But, but by the estimates I could find, we're selling about 82 million new fridges a year, many of them going to people who never had a refrigerator before. They finally got that electricity we heard about earlier. They finally got the chance to have cool food. And they wanted that. That, that growth is going to continue. And indeed, the sales of refrigerators are rising 4% a year worldwide. So I would submit to you that in spite of all of our successes, global refrigerator energy use is probably higher today than it's been at any time in human history. And that says we all have more to do. So how should we reconcile these efficiency policies with the climate limits we face? This is, I guess, really the heart of the message I would take to the president. If we need 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, you would assume maybe, if we're lucky, renewables would do half of that, although they'd be expensive. So we'd still need absolute consumption to drop by 1% a year for each of the next 40 years. If you did that with plug loads or with appliances, remember what I showed you, they were the ones that were headed upwards so sharply. So we don't just need to level that off. We've got to bring it down by 1% a year. I would submit that means we need ambitious mandatory efficiency standards for all plug loads. They need to be updated much more frequently than they are now, and we've got to get the least efficient products off the market. Secondly, uh, we should take a cue from literally every other economy in the world that uses uh, energy labeling, and they always do mandatory categorical labeling, like the example I've shown you here from Europe. We and, and Canada literally stand alone in not choosing this form of label, and yet it's been shown to steadily drive purchases toward the most efficient products and away from the least efficient ones. Consumer education and incentive efforts should be focused on greatly increasing the market share of the most efficient products, including efforts like top 10. And then lastly, uh, progressive efficiency specifications that say the larger and the more powerful your product is, the more energy efficient it needs to be to ensure that absolute consumption stays low. There's a philosophy of efficiency we would challenge all manufacturers to follow. I won't take you through all of these, but in lieu of a specific quantitative requirement for each kind of product, these are the kind of themes that if every manufacturer followed with what they made, the products would be inherently more efficient. And this list was developed with input from many of you at an ACEEE summer study some years ago. We recently did some measurements for a client to ask the question, well, if you thought about consumer electronics like appliances, how bad are the worst ones? How good are the best ones? How far do we need to go to improve? I just highlight a couple examples here that really stunned us. If you take something like playing a DVD uh, or a Blu-ray, you know, you sit down to watch a movie, you could do that in a high-end gaming PC, you could do that with your game console like a, like a PS3, you could do that with a standalone DVD player. The differences in the amount of power it takes to do that can vary not just by 30 or 40 percent, like you're used to dealing with in appliances, they can vary by factors of 50 or 100 or more. And so there's a gigantic energy use difference in what device you choose and how efficient it is. 
And that's why we mentioned that products need to scale their power use to how much work they're doing. Because computers right now and, and game consoles are not very good at that. They, they draw about the same amount of power no matter how hard you want them to work. It's a big, big opportunity for savings. Here's another example. Um, Energy Star created a, a specification which was pretty ambitious at the time to help computers use less idle power. And so you can see they had a category for low-end computers and one for slightly more powerful computers and one for very powerful computers. And indeed, uh, the cutoffs helped to bring average power consumption down a little bit. But the most energy efficient computers were drawing radically less power than the Energy Star spec and radically less power than most of what was being sold. So indeed, we now have machines like this one up here, which I've put uh, a keychain next to it for scale. This is a fully functional desktop PC. It's a few inches square, and it draws somewhere around six or seven watts when it's idling, waiting for you to do something. This is the kind of PC that could meet most people's needs in the office or home office environment and is not being widely sold, or even people aren't even aware of it in the United States. That's our future appliance standard. Uh, we've also been asked by clients to, to investigate the question, well, what about the traditional appliances that aren't being regulated at all? So we measured a bunch of clothes dryers recently in our lab at ECOS and found out that the test procedure isn't looking at the right thing. Literally, by assuming that all dryers behave similarly, it misses the efficiency opportunity. Here you see big, big differences between dryers all being asked to perform the same basic function. And we estimated that just fixing the test procedure and then basing standards and labeling on that could save the US $3 billion a year. And dryers are the largest single end use for which we have no labeling and no significant energy efficiency standards or utility programs. On refrigerators, our favorite success story, these are some data that ACEEE put together recently. Yes, refrigerators have gotten better. Yes, the range of differences in efficiency is narrowed. But notice that you've got some kinds of refrigerators that just inherently use a lot more energy than others. It makes a lot more sense to put the freezer on the bottom or on the top than it does to design the refrigerator side by side. Yet we still have separate efficiency requirements for each of those instead of driving the market toward the most efficient way of designing a fridge. I'd like to leave you with this visual, which is one of my favorites. Um, here we have people who are desperately interested in doing more to save energy. And uh, we've increased, in the case of Energy Star, you know, we've increased the amount of square inches of screen area on a TV that we can illuminate per watt. And that's great. But if we have acres and acres of screen area, it's just possible that when we're going to use up some of the savings we thought we were getting by making the products more efficient. So I would challenge uh, this president and this audience to make sure that our efficiency gains keep pace with performance and sales gains if we really want to achieve absolute consumption. We have much to do, and I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, oh, this is interesting. Uh, I, I noticed that Art has just uh, has just entered a new uh, relationship. Um, I will discuss that later. Um, this is. <coughs> I think I want to share another dilemma of event planning with you, um, uh, including unexpected uh, transparencies or overheads. Um, as you've seen with a number of the speakers, we've been describing some of the areas in which art has worked over the years, from uh, everything from forecasting electricity demand to energy efficient refrigerators, to energy efficiency in general, to energy use in developing countries, and reducing peak electrical demand. And of course, this wouldn't be uh, complete without uh, art's latest Mm, obsession, perhaps, or certainly concern, and that is reducing the, the effects of the urban heat island. Now, normally what we do is bring in one of the researchers who's been involved in that, uh, and that would be Hashem Akbari, and he would speak uh, and describe some of the research that Art and he have been involved with in, in, over the last 20 years. Unfortunately, Hashem can't be here, and in searching for a uh, good replacement speaker, um, the only person we could come up with is um, Art Rosenfeld. Um, and the problem, the problem is, you know, we only wanted that these people to speak for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> with that introduction, <laughs> no Art, it's yours.
Okay, okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, go to the first slide, which is what I was going to do to emphasize that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm really stepping in for Hasha Mekbari. Um, I don't remember when we started working together, but it was, uh, as I remember, during the depths of the Reagan administration. Um, the problem with heat islands and white roofs and white surfaces and so on has been around for a long time. And uh, I'm going to show you that uh, uh, it's not as quite as hard as we thought. There's, there's quite a lot of practice. I learned in the last week or so to <coughs> use uh, Google Earth and find a lot of white roofs in a lot of places. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about some new comments. But uh, I want to say I'm sorry Hashem's not here. Um, He's in Canada. He uh, is planning to leave pretty soon for a trip where he's on the board of something called the Cool Roof Rating Council for Europe. Uh, the problem with the Cool Roof is uh, it looks just like any other roof, so you have to measure it to see whether it's up to stay, up to snuff, and uh, that has to be. That's an important piece of infra infrastructure. Uh, a, a brief uh, a trip around the world. Oh, incidentally, I want to announce, uh, Al Alan told me that everybody had 10 minutes, but I got 20. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use uh, 15, and then I'm going to introduce my uh, successor commissioner. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment, but uh, Commissioner Gellert, uh, Eggert, is going to uh, talk about uh, why he wants to pursue this some more in California. Um, Bermuda has cool roofs so that they don't, don't have to do air conditioning. Uh, they're motivated to keep them clean because they also collect rainwater from the roofs. Uh, if you look at Google Maps and try to find a red roof, you can find two on the island. Um, white roofs have been known for a long time before air conditioning. Uh, there's a Greek island, and Athens, uh, seen from the air, has a lot of white roofs. Uh, there's Hyderabad, India. Uh, this is actually taken from a tower of a picture I'll show, you, uh, I'll show you later. But here are some Indians whitewashing their roof so that they're a little more comfortable to sleep on at night and a little more comfortable to live under in the summertime. <coughs> uh, I got this one from Walmart. Uh, I think it's in Chico. I remember it's in Northern California. Uh, Here's a modern Walmart store with uh, something like a thousand uh, skylights which you can't see in an occasional air conditioner unit. Uh, this is the Walmart parking lot where you can't see all the cars because there are a lot of trees. This is a competitor. Shame on him. <laughs> this is his parking lot. This is, in fact, uh, an experiment in Hyderabad with two identical towers, uh, one of which uh, was left dark and one of which was painted white. Here it is after repainting. Um, the air conditioning load of the floor underneath the uh, white tower, white roof tower, uh, dropped by about 15% uh, compared to uh, its competitor compared to its uh, twin. And that's typical experience for uh, uh, white roofs compared to dark roofs all over the world. Um, this is UC Davis, as seen by on satellite. Congratulations to UC Davis. <laughs> this is uh, central Tucson. Uh, the university's in the center. It's still got a problem with a few old uh, terracotta tile roofs, but in general it's white, uh, including a sports arena down here. Um, what's interesting, however, is that the uh, people who know it's hot in Tucson, and uh, a lot of the middle class housing around, as you can see, is white roofed already. 
Uh, this is uh, modern American super middle class in Punta Gorda, Florida. Uh, almost every roof is white. Uh, this is uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Henry Kelly and Kathy Zoy. Uh, the DOE building is right here. Uh, it has some feeble attempt not to be black, but aerospace is way ahead of you. The, uh, the uh, Supreme Court is uh, the Supreme Court is nice and white, but uh, the Capitol building seemed to have some uh, copper, which has gone a nice color green, but unfortunately cannot be seen from the street. So uh, you may have a historic buildings problem there. The Pentagon has newly been refurbished, and uh, it has a green roof. Shame on the Pentagon. Um, this is uh, where we're going to go off and talk about white roofs and their future benefits. Um, in California, since the 2005 building standards, if a roof of a commercial building is flat so there's no architectural issue, then uh, it must be white. Nobody has complained a lot. Uh, this is a typical new residential roof in California. Uh, if a roof is sloped, you run into architectural issues. Uh, the law, Title 24, says that in the hottest five climate zones of the state starting, I think, uh, March 1st, um, if a roof is sloped, it must be at least a cool colored. And that's a technology I'd love to talk about and do not have time to. Um, question is, if you look here, how much more energy do you use compared to a white roof? And so the next slide is a plot of uh, the solar absorptance, which runs from zero for white to 100% absorbing of the sunlight for black. Uh, where does a typical roof fall? And the answer is, if it's red or green or uh, Blue, no, no, blue roofs aren't very popular. Red or green or brown. Um, it, it's sort of halfway uh, as bad as black. So it's nice to have light colors and it's nice to have a technology which uh, reflects as much of the invisible near infrared as possible. Uh, but anyway, going from a typical color to white uh, is illustrated here. A, a good white roof runs about uh, 10 degrees centigrade, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, above ambient air temperature under, at noon on the August, uh, under the August sun. Uh, a, and you can walk on it um, barefoot. Uh, if you go to a dark colored roof up here, you're running 50 degrees centigrade, 90 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient. And if you try to walk on it, you burn your feet. Uh, if you don't believe me, try it sometime. Now, if the roof gets hot, it degrades sunlight from radiation which, to which the atmosphere is transparent into heat, which is subject to the greenhouse effect. The atmosphere, by definition, is transparent to sunlight because we live at the bottom of the atmosphere. We see sunlight clearly, and we can see mountains uh, 40 miles away. And so uh, that's the... That, that's the radiation you want to keep stay with and reflect back into space. Um, about 10 or 20 years ago, it occurred to almost everybody who works in the energy efficiency field to try to figure out whether there was enough white roof around to affect global warming. Uh, we weren't very sophisticated then, and there wasn't a carbon or carbon dioxide market. And the trouble is, if you try to calculate the efficiency of a white roof city uh, in cooling the world, you turn out to work in uh, milli degrees, and it's pretty hard to sell. Um, recently, meaning two years ago, uh, Hashem Akbari and Subari Menon at LBL and I as at the Energy Commission uh, decided that uh, it would be interesting, however, to state uh, the effect of a white roof in terms of avoided 
the word is offset actually, offset tons of CO2. That is, a white roof as compared with a dark roof does cool the world a little bit. If you take the amount of cooling radiative forcing that is avoided by a white roof and you equate that to the amount of heating that is uh, brought on by a ton of carbon dioxide, then we have a feeling for it because we know that carbon dioxide trades for something like $10 a ton. Uh, the, the slogan then that we put at the end of our article was that a small house, namely about a thousand square feet of white roof, replacing a colored roof, avoids the emission of about 10 tons of carbon dioxide. Now the 10 tons is spread around the world, but if you want to think about it, uh, think of a, a column of atmosphere above a white roof, and uh, think of the white roof as cooling the world as much as 10 tons stacked above that roof of CO2 would heat it. Uh, that was pretty interesting, uh, and nobody paid any attention. Um, and we weren't terribly sure of our calculations. We are not uh, climatologists. Uh, we, we, we know some things about the climate, like, uh, for one thing, uh, we, we know what the average cloud cover, cover, cover is uh, above the land. Uh, we know that uh, carbon dioxide uh, emitted from, say, a car or uh, a factory, uh, that only about half of that stays in the atmosphere. It gets into the atmosphere, and about a half of it disappears uh, sort of miraculously uh, in the first year. And then after there, it's up for 100 or 1,000 years. But we didn't know how to, we didn't have the access to a global climate model. Uh, recently, uh, the results of this paper, which I'm now going to refer to as Akbari et al., uh, have been modeled by uh, the same group, except uh, uh, Dr. Menon has access to a climate model. She's, in fact, a student of Jim Hansen's. And uh, she brought in some collaborators from uh, Goddard Space Station in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, and they ran a model uh, including a land, global land surface model and have uh, corroborated uh, our results of 10 tons per square feet by actually coming out with a, a real run uh, which got 13 tons per thousand square feet. Uh, and another group, uh, Olison et al. at the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, uh, also at the same time came out with another run, and they also get about 13 tons of CO2 per square foot. So uh, we're, we're getting bolder and more aggressive. And uh, the other huge uh, support is that uh, uh, Energy Secretary Steve Chu has uh, uh, taken up the ball on this and has been advocating uh, white roofs around the world uh, for some time. Um, one of the implications of extending 10 tons per square foot, we're gonna stay with our slogan, per thousand square feet, we're gonna stay with our slogan uh, worldwide. Uh, how, much off how much CO2 is offset if we widen all eligible roofs, uh, flat roofs worldwide? Uh, the first of all thing I want to emphasize is that roofs come colored, uh, even concrete uh, roofs. Uh, have some sort of a coating on them to waterproof them, and that coating can contain uh, uh, titanium dioxide, which is the most popular white scatterer that makes roofs look white, or it can contain red pigment or green pigment or blue pigment. And uh, my frustration is that if you land at an airport in, say, Beijing, you see acres of flat roof buildings, and they're all blue or green or white but very, I'm sorry, blue or green or red, but uh, they haven't gotten onto white. Um, answer, 15 billion tons of CO2, um, which is half of last year's worldwide emissions of CO2. Uh, for those of you who aren't used to the word gigaton, the scientists use gigaton, the economists and the energy industry say build it, building 
billion tons, and the reason it's got tons got two N's and an E is their metric tons, which uh, is only 10% difference. Now, um, wh what does it take to <clears throat> understand what uh, 15 billion tons means? Uh, if you paint a roof, the, the next, immediately the next day, the uh, world is slightly cooler, a nano degree. Um, and everything else we think about is in terms of rates. Cars emit five tons a year into the US average cars, uh, four tons a year into their world average cars, uh, but it's always per year. So uh, in order to understand what this might be and how many cars off the road it might take, um, uh, Hashem and I have been selling the idea that you have to think of the lifetime of the roof or the time it takes the program to be implemented. They're both 15, 20 years. Um, if you have 15 gigatons and you get them applied over 20 years, then you've run out of roof and you have to, but the roof just ride it away and starting to leak anyway, so then you start it all over again. So take 15 years as a time scale, then you get one gigaton a year, one billion tons per year, and that's equivalent to taking uh, 250, mil 250 million cars and uh, taking them off the road for 20 years, and it costs nothing because uh, you're gonna order a roof in some color anyway, and it might as well be white. It's no more expensive than red or blue or green. Uh, what's going on in California with this? Uh, Title 24 uh, applied to commercial buildings in 2005. Uh, it will apply to all buildings in 2011. And it says if a roof is flat, it uh, should be white. Uh, Georgia and Florida credit white roofs. Uh, ASHRAE, which is the name for the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, uh, gives credit in its recommendations and its calculations for white roofs. Uh, the International Energy Efficiency Code uh, will very likely give credit for white roofs. Uh, we're, we're sort of on a roll, and uh, that's very encouraging. Um, what should happen next, and uh, this is where I get around to introducing uh, Anthony Eggert, uh, is that um, when calculating the economic optimum design for Title 24 or for utility rebates, um, we should uh, recognize that there is an externality that uh, it should be putting, put into planning calculations and that will favor white roofs on houses and further that we recognize as soon as possible that uh, this, d this can be justified economically in California for most buildings because they're mainly air conditioned. <laughs> but if you go to India or Indonesia or southern China, um, or Buenos Aires, uh, th a lot of buildings are not air conditioned. Uh, they still cool the world at 10 tons per thousand square feet. And uh, uh, even unair conditioned buildings uh, will cool the world, will make the city more comfortable if they have light colored roofs. And my final remark is that um, this idea doesn't apply just to buildings. Um, if you buy a Morris Mini, or if you look at somebody else's Morris Mini, uh, you'll notice they all have white roofs. I don't know quite how they sold that idea, but I'm going to find out. Um, most people think that school buses are yellow, but in fact, every passenger bus in the United States has a white roof. And if you look at school buses carefully, you'll see they all have white roofs. And uh, trains, uh, particularly trains in India, I was in India recently, uh, most of them are not air-conditioned, they're uncomfortable as can be, uh, but they have blue roofs. That's silly. <laughs> Anthony Eggert has succeeded me in Energy Commissioner and in some of my wild ideas, and I'm very happy to have him here, and uh, there's the mouse if you want. No, you, yeah, there's the mouse if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Art. And I'm going to bring Art back up here for a, a proper uh, um, uh, thanking for this, this great talk. Um,
Art did ask me to, to join him for this talk to provide a brief update on California's policy uh, relative to Cool Roos, and it is my great honor to do so. I would like to title the portion of this talk, Art's Cool Influence on California Policy. Um, to create and implement durable energy and environmental policy at any level of government really takes a combination of vision, ambition, uh, intellect, and persistence. Uh, or for those of you who are, who are here earlier, uh, nagging. Um, Art, Art clearly embodies all of these great qualities in a single person, and he's a cool guy to boot. As Art outlined in his talk, cool roofs for buildings have now become an essential component of California's building policy. Uh, and as he, uh, he briefly mentioned, the 2008 building efficiency standards includes white and cool colored roof requirements for both new and retrofit residential and commercial buildings depending on their climate zone, but they don't yet uh, include the uh, albedo or the credit for the externality of the albedo effect. Additionally, recently passed uh, 2010 California Green Building Standards Codes uh, include, now include two additional stretch codes for cool roofs, which will encourage builders to go beyond Title 24 for aged solar reflectance and thermal emittance values. Uh, there's two tiers, the first tier for residential is consistent with the Title 24 prescriptive level for non-residential, um, which is, which is uh, um, what Art outlined. And the second tier includes significantly higher values for both residential and non-residential buildings. And now for the first time, and because of Art's proposal, the 2011 California Building Energy Efficiency, Efficiency Standards will be evaluated for the extent to which roof albedo should be credited and reducing global climate change as a performance credit in the building performance standard. And that's directly uh, due to, to Art's uh, great advocacy. <laughs> so we, we at CEC, the California Energy Commission, are working with our colleagues at the Air Resources Board, the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, uh, to, to be able to quantify and determine the proper level of credit uh, to give this global benefit. We've even made the use of federal stimulus funding cool, uh, as cool roofs are included in the checklist requirements for ARA, American Recovery Act funded resident, residential retrofits. So when uh, people receive the funds for upgrading their facilities, um, that they will follow the, the cool roof policy of California. Our cars will soon be cooler. Uh, the Air Resources Board did recently adopt a regulation which requires that passenger cars, uh, trucks, and SUVs be equipped with windows that reduce the amount of heat that enters the vehicle from solar radiation. Uh, this means less heat inside the vehicle, which will allow the air conditioning units to be downsized or used less, uh, reducing both emissions and uh, energy consumption. And the state will now be a, a cool customer for cars. Our de Department of General Services has recently added cool color and reflective windish windshield provisions for certain uh, state vehicle contracts, again, uh, directly uh, due to arts advocacy. Uh, finally, I would say no talk at a university would be complete about talking about the need for more research. And I think you know, one of the things uh, Art pioneered uh, in the policy arena is the idea of, of science-driven policy. And so we want to make sure that we have the best available research as we move forward in implementing policies uh, relevant to, to cool roofs and, and cool pavements and cool cars. Uh, the work of our uh, public interest energy research program has contributed already significantly to the research on cool roofing materials that are now contributing, contributing measurable energy and economic savings through our standards. Recently, our Pure Buildings team teamed up with Air Resources Board and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to further expedite the deployment of cool roofs and cool pavement technologies throughout California communities to save energy, reduce emissions, and improve the quality of life in urban environments. To name just a few of the tasks from this project, it will provide technical assistance to local governments for developing cool community programs and a website to provide consumers information about cool roofs. It will compare residences with and without uh, cool roofs to document both the direct energy savings and the indirect uh, global cooling or albedo effects. A survey will be developed to understand consumer choice uh, because that is a component in terms of our ability to deploy or disseminate this technology to understand that choice based on economics, aesthetics, and availability. Um, 
With assistance from Caltrans and others, the project will also experiment with various cool pavement technologies to develop a better understanding of their costs, albedo, durability, and life cycle energy uh, and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, some of that research is also going on uh, with a collaboration here at UC Davis and the Pavement Research Center. And finally, this project will develop training for builders and contractors to ensure that cool roofs and pavements are done right and that they're installed in the most efficient way. Uh, the total funding for this project is ar around a little just shy of a million dollars. Um, it's already kicked off and will occur over this coming year. Uh, I've been informed uh, by some of the research partners that um, if to fully execute all those tasks uh, certainly will require additional funding. If there happen to be any well-funded federal government agencies in the audience uh, who might have an interest in this topic, I encourage you to come see me and Art after the after this session. Um, and, and finally, I would have to say, you know, again, achieving our, our shared energy, environmental, and economic goals, including the goal of avoiding the worst effects of climate change, is not going to be easy. Uh, it is, however, it is these innovative yet relatively simple and cost-effective measures, such as cool roofs, that can be readily implemented that give me great hope. With Art's passion for, uh, in fact, with Art's passion for all things cool, roofs, cars, and pavements, I have a prediction. Uh, the future, uh, which will hopefully be cool, uh, will also be so bright that we'll all have to wear shades. And I have a little, uh, uh, a token here, and I want to art, have Art come back up here and uh, provide this. Uh, this is a, a pair of cool colored shades. Um, and uh, you can't, probably can't see it from out there. It says cool on one side, CEC on the other. Uh, these, are, these are for Art, uh, so that he can look confidently into the future and continue as he always has. <laughs> And so that I can't see the audience. I, but, you try it. Okay, well, actually, you know what? I did bring my own pair uh, um, because I'm, I'm hoping uh, in my new position I'll be able to also follow your vision uh, to the best of my abilities so that I can realize uh, every, many of the things that you started at the commission. Um, it's my great honor to be in that uh, position and uh, I'm looking forward to working with all of you to help uh, make that become a reality. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. I forgot to make one comment about the slide of Washington, D.C., so I'm going to try the back slide business for a moment. Yes. Um, I wanted to point out one thing about this slide, which I think is, is interesting. Um, here's the Capitol with its greenish copper roof and the mall, and I pointed out the uh, Supreme Court building. Um, this is all... East Capitol Street sort of thing. Um, it has lots and lots of white roofs. It's way ahead of the government. Uh, I, I then thought that it would be possible to see how old these roofs were and uh, what was it like uh, 20 years ago. And that failed because uh, the uh, precision of the satellite maps got terrible as you went back 20 years, so you could just see big, blushy messes, couldn't tell. But uh, I think it is encouraging that uh, it doesn't seem to be ho too hard for people to understand that you can reduce air conditioning bills and make yourself more comfortable if you have a white roof. So uh, I think we're at about quitting time. Um, I guess I should ask if anybody in the audience has at most one. If you would allow me. <laughs> All right. I, I, I knew we needed a leader. Ralph is here. Th things, things are about to start happening very quickly. So first we're going to have a seamless transition in which I'm going to ask the existing panelists to remove themselves after a magnificent job and the new panelists to come on. Thank you. And Dan Adler, if, 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 he, if he would go over to my left, I'm Ralph Cavana from NRDC, and as the panels are changing, so none of you has the slightest sense that this is a moment when you can get up or absent yourselves from the premises, because you don't want to miss one second. 
Uh, I'm going to make a quick observation with my friend Joe Cravoza from the University of California at Davis. Now, the friends of Rosenfeld, uh, and Art, you stay up there for sure. You aren't moving. You stay up on the platform. Uh, the friends of Rosenfeld are delighted to have the opportunity through this symposium to honor him, but we are not prepared to stop here. Uh, and the University of California at Davis uh, has determined that it wants to associate Art's name permanently with the Center on Energy Efficiency and to establish, and this is something which Art and his friends have considered and applauded and approved, to establish the Arthur H. Rosenfeld Chair at the University of California, Davis, and at the Energy Efficiency Center as both a substantive and symbolic part of the effort to ensure that there are many more Rosenfelds for all of the policymakers in this room to employ. In, in, order, in order to do that, we need to raise a million dollars, and believe me, by university standards, that is a bargain. And we are three quarters of the way there, and I would like to get the rest of the way there this afternoon. Many of you have already helped, and we are profoundly grateful. But for any who can help further or make additional suggestions, Joe, what can we tell them about all of the eminently approachable people who are here in the audience today? Eminently approachable are Ralph Cabana. Um, I'm uh, pleased to be uh, directing in part this effort uh, that many are participating in. Uh, our project lead is uh, Smiko Hong over here. And UC Davis is honored to be establishing the Arthur H. Rosenfeld Chair in Energy Efficiency. It's going to be a wonderful coming together. I know Art, the field, and UC Davis will be proud to have uh, everybody associated with this. Uh, both with art and with the shareholders to come. It will help us mature more rapidly the field, and we welcome all of you to participate. I don't know if our goal is to have this done by 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock or 7.30, uh, but whatever it is, uh, we'd like you to come and talk to us. We have uh, Chevron, Sempra, and Edison uh, contributing $100,000. Uh, we have, uh, I'm sorry, PG&E, P the utilities are in at 100,000. Chevron and Power Integrations at $50,000. We have 20 other organizations and individuals contributing $10,000 or more. Uh, and any and all contributions are welcome, as is aggressive and spirited volunteerism uh, in support of the chair. So uh, we hope you'll join us. Samiko, Joe, Ralph are standing by. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> And the program is now in the very capable hands of Dan Adler, the president of the California Clean Energy Fund. Thank you very much, Ralph and Joe. Uh, this is going to be a, a very fun part of the afternoon. Not that that data-driven conversation wasn't fun, but we're going to shift from talking about efficiency science and art's legacy to just really talking about art, which I think is kind of what we all want to be doing at this point. Uh, let me say a few words from my perspective of having had the pleasure of working with art. Ralph mentioned I'm the president of the California Clean Energy Fund. Uh, it's really a privilege to be in any kind of leadership role, and I'll be honest that the leadership starts at the top with Art and Mike Peavy and his colleagues on my board of directors. We are an odd animal. We're a nonprofit venture capital fund, and we're dedicated principally to identifying the gaps in the financing of the clean tech transformation. We came into being out of the California electricity crisis, and we have c consistently railed against the investment community to understand all the opportunities that they've been missing. And frankly, no opportunity has been missed more consistently and with greater skill than the energy efficiency investment opportunity. And I can tell you that as of about five years ago when we started in this business, we got consistently, I think, three answers to why financiers broadly were not thinking about efficiency. The first was, well, you know, it's just not sexy. And what they really mean is, you know, it's not making any money. So it really kind of was reductive and begged the question. But I would say, you know, it's not sexy. I mean, look around. Look, at, look around this room. You know, I can, I can see the, the, the calendar. I can see the calendar coming together right now. We could, we could have art as January for the cold winter months. But the, the serious point is that to make something attractive, to make it sexy for private capital, requires a focused effort on market design. And that's going to be, I'm going to come back to this point several times. The other issue was, well, we don't understand the customers. We don't like the customers. We don't like utilities. We're venture capitalists. We exist to defeat utilities, particularly in the information technology world. 
Lo, three years later, when really the only entity standing with a balance sheet to speak of are utilities, and the private financial community is really finally coming to terms with the way that the energy business works, all of the messaging that, that Art and Mike and his colleagues have been offering about how to partner with utilities in a collaborative model of, of capital allocation is really coming home to roost. And the third piece, which I think is most interesting and frankly the most challenging, is we used to hear, and frankly we still hear, there's no innovation in energy efficiency. It's just really swapping out light bulbs. Uh, and when they would say no innovation, they would mean typically there's no snazzy new technological innovation. And that, I think, is patently false. I think we'd all have to agree that that is false. And it's false precisely because our inefficiency is a function of our abundance. And that's the great story of human development over the last century, is material abundance almost without limit, even accounting for all the externalities that we don't value. That abundance itself is a function of our technological progress. So if you follow that chain of logic, how could our inefficiency not be a technology problem? To round out that point, we saw last year for the first time venture capital allocating more money to energy efficiency than any other category, more than solar, more than biofuels, more than anything. They're getting it, and it's because of the consistent and graceful message of men like Art and women like Diane Grunick and others who have led this industry for so many years. Now we're finally at the verge of a, a major transformation. Innovation is not just in technology, however, it's in business strategies, it's in market approaches. That has been Art's contribution to CalCEF. We're just as dedicated to reformulating the way that business works and the way that markets operate as we are into finding this snazzy new piece of intellectual property that satisfies the gee whiz factor but doesn't really move us towards a truly sustainable energy system. So I will round out my comments with some perspective on how we got here and how I think Art helped bring us here. And it really is the style as well as the substance. I started my career in California in clean energy 2001, really right after the California electricity crisis. And I'm something of a recovering supply cider, so you'll have to forgive me when I say that I didn't know who Art Rosenfeld was at that, at that point. And I was in charge of putting together some forensic public policy. What happened to the electricity crisis? Why did California get it so badly wrong? And Part of the approach was to bring together the august leadership of the state, including a, a California energy commissioner who was working on market design. And we'd just sort of chat about it, and I'm sure we'd figure it out. Uh, lo and behold, up at the last minute, that California energy commissioner had to back out. So my boss called me into her office and said, Dan, uh, we, Art Rosenfeld is going to be taking the commissioner's place on this panel. That sounds great. I'm sure he's a qualified guy. Make sure he doesn't talk about energy efficiency. <laughs> and I said, oh, you know, no problem. I, I'm a young... Grad, I just out of graduate school, I understand, I know how to work with these people, it'd be no problem. So I called up Dr. Rosenfeld, he called me sir immediately, when I was like, well this guy's a, this guy's a pushover, you know, he's going to do exactly what I say. <laughs> when it came time for him to present on the root causes of the California electricity crisis, he gave his energy efficiency presentation that every time I see it, I learn a little bit more. And initially people in the audience were saying, well, what does this have to do with market design? What does this have to do with the electricity crisis? It built into a presentation that the core of everything we do in designing energy markets has to have energy efficiency at its base. That's how we pay for everything else we want to do. That's how we distribute the economic benefits of the energy transition. And that's how we create green jobs. And I left that thinking, that is science policy. That is how you do science policy, presenting facts in a respectful manner, educating gradually, embracing collaboration, and it was, the, for me, the ultimate lesson in how social policy and social science can be executed in the way that the hard sciences are, and it is an uh, enduring testimony in my memory, and I think we all have similar stories of the multidisciplinary brilliance of Art Rosenfeld, um, and I would just like to say a personal, profound thank you for that early lesson in my career that I've carried with me ever since. And now we get to the really fun part, after my bloviating. We're going to give a series of pronouncements and awards to Dr. Rosenfeld. And beginning, first of all, is John De Don DeStazio of the Sacramento Municipal Utilities District. Thank you, John. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm honored to be here to, um, on behalf of the SMUD board, and I might acknowledge that Bill Slayton from our board is here. Uh, Art's obviously been an inspiration to all of us. Certainly the SMUD board, Bill and his other six uh, colleagues on the SMUD board have been inspired by Art in the policies that they've established and the work we've done over 20 years. Um, 
I have a resolution to uh, present on behalf of the board today. But I will say I'm not going to uh, go through all of the whereas clauses. Most all of us uh, here are very familiar with arts accomplishments. My former colleague, Jan Shorey, said uh, Art Rosenfeld is actually the Kevin Bacon of the energy efficiency world. Everybody's separated by six degrees or less. Um, but I think to me what's most remarkable is for all of his accomplishments and all the wonderful things he's done and the, the inspiration and the mentoring he's provided all of us. Um, to me, what's most remarkable is the humility and the good humor and the intellectual curiosity that he still carries today. That is truly inspirational. Um, I had the great occasion a couple years ago to drive to Lake Tahoe in an early generation Prius with Art. And I'm surprised we weren't in an accident because he and I both feverishly looked at the screen the whole way, tracking our fuel efficiency up the hill and down the hill. And uh, it was quite a remarkable day and, and a lot of fun. So uh, it's with all due respect and just wonderful admiration for Art and his accomplishments. And again, on behalf of the SMUD board uh, that I present this resolution to you. Thank you very much.